All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from beautiful blue skied San Diego. And today I am joined by Kevin Snow, who is near Minneapolis. How are you doing, Kevin? I am great. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing fantastic. And Kevin's the founder and chief strategist with Time on Target, a veteran-owned business focused on helping small business owners grow their business through effective sales and marketing strategy execution. And thank you for your service, Kevin. Uh, so you're very fun. welcome. It's, it's, it's my privilege. So, yeah. All right. So as I said, we're going to talk today about sales automation, how salespeople mess it up and how they can use it to close sales faster. So, um, Let's let's baseline this for you. When you mean mess it up, right? What do you mean by that? So there's a few different ways that uh, small businesses screw up their automation. Uh, one is they piecemeal stuff together. So they're like, ooh, I need a video thing. So they get Zoom. <laughs> and then I need a calendar thing. So then they get Calendly. And then I need this and I need that. And they don't ever put together an actual strategy to utilize the technology. So it all works together and actually helps them and is easy to use. The other thing that they do wrong all the time, uh, especially when you look at automating social media outreach, is it they they use they just go and find templates. They find these horrible swipe files on the internet that and then they use those. They use those for their email drip campaigns, they use them for their social outreach and they don't actually take time to figure out what is going to resonate with their prospects. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more because I think, um, well, there's a lot of things I think have influenced this over the years. I think the whole inbound uh, culture that came in, you know, where everybody, where salespeople suddenly thought, oh, I can just sit around and wait for leads to come in. <laughs> and then and then the automation came in and then it's like, great, I don't even have to do anything. I can just set up all of these campaigns and just sit back and wait for it. And I mean, and just, it just doesn't work that way. And to your point, if there's no strategy behind it, it's already doomed to failure. Oh yeah, they you see all the internet gurus saying, "Hey, buy my process, buy my program, and I'll give you everything you need, and you'll be closing all this business in a week." Well, that's not how it works. There's no such thing as an easy button for sales. It, it, you have to do the time and you have to put the effort in to figure out what's going to work for your specific target. You know, who you sell to and who I sell to may be similar. But what's going to resonate for our specific products aren't going to be the same. Yeah, no, absolutely. So how should how should sales people approach automation? So for salespeople, it needs to be really how do I free up my time? That is the number one thing for salespeople. It's how do I get rid of repetitive tasks? So the number one thing we look at for salespeople is how do you get rid of sending those follow-up thank you emails? You know, the ones that you would, as a, when I was a salesperson, I would normally do on a Friday and mm -hmm. I would not pay attention when I was doing it because it was all cut and paste and I'd forget to change names. So I would send John a, hey, Julia email. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I did send it like, oh my God, what did I just do? And it's because it's this tedious work that they don't want to be doing. So mm -hmm. figure out what things you can get rid of as far as uh, data entry and repetitive tasks. And the other big thing that sales reps spend a ton of time on that automation can fix for them is they're looking for content. They are looking for content to send to their clients at specific points in the sales process. So that's one of the big things that we do with our clients is actually work them through, all right, so what is your process? How do your clients make decisions? When do we need to give them specific types of content that's gonna resonate with them to get them to move into that next step? So if you can map that out and use automation, now your salespeople can spend more time doing appointments instead of scouring through the corporate network looking for a flyer that they can email someone. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think uh, the more you can remove the, the road or repetitive tasks, as you say, um, the better that you can focus on the high quality uh, or the higher quality activities. Yep. But the, the, other, the other problem being is that, uh, as I said earlier, I mean, sometimes they get a little too addicted to the whole automation <laughs> piece. And it's sort of like, great, I don't really have to do anything. <laughs> Yep. And it's really depends on the automation system you're using. So 
with the one that I use with most of my clients, there's actually a human aspect that can be built in. So we can set up, hey, you need to go do this thing. So there's this task you have to do with the prospect. So there's now the, it's a high touch, high value activity that we wanna make sure it gets done at a certain point. So, you know, the good automation systems and processes are gonna make sure they're building in those touch points. So they're doing the right things at the right time and they're not forgetting about them. And then they can use their rest of their time for prospecting, building those relationships or networking. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that approach. Uh, because when you build into when you build the human activities into the process, so that it doesn't, so that automation doesn't kind of kind of sit out on its own yep. to the side, where you can end up like just relying too much of it, but, but building in those human touch points, those high value touch points, or also, um, you know, where you can get a lot more target. I mean, that's, that's, for me, that's the perfect way to do it. Yeah, you look at companies like HubSpot, and HubSpot does this brilliantly whenever I go to specific content on their site, because they have great content, I'm not, I'm not never going to say they don't. I go there to find really cool things and get ideas. And I'll always get an email from them within about five or 10 minutes of me leaving the page saying, Hey, so you were looking at this thing. You should also check out this stuff. And because I'm also in their list of potential partners, I also get the phone call. Hmm. Now that gets a bit annoying because it comes after every time I come to their site What I do differently and what I recommend to clients is that, hey, you need to know where those high value pages are. So, and how they correspond to your sales process. So someone visits pricing, that's usually a sign that they're actually looking at making a buying decision. That should trigger a call. Hey, John, your prospect XYZ Corp just went to our pricing page. You should follow up. So it needs to be really targeted follow-ups and targeted touch points, not just, hey, John went to to the website, let's give him a call and see Mm -hmm. if he's ready to buy now, which a lot of times is like, hey, let's set up a meeting. Well, no, that's not a good way to follow up because I may not be ready for that meeting yet. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And I think, yeah, that's where you have to be very targeted and look at what is the activity that's taking place because it may be a situation where that follow up email suffices right now and maybe they're into a nurture campaign as you say it may you may have a detrimental impact if you pick up the phone immediately and i'm going well hey kevin you know you're on our site and (laughs) and you're like going oh really um but as you say it it may be appropriate at times when if you see as you said they're visiting your pricing page and they're back on the product description then they're back on the you know the pricing page again or something and you're saying okay here's somebody who it's worthwhile me calling out because clearly they're engaged and they're looking at the right things yeah when we've talked to clients for um or let me rephrase it when we've talked to our clients clients and did Mm -hmm. interviews with them trying to figure out all right so what is your buying process how do your clients actually buy because most companies don't understand that you know we always ask hey you know when was your first interaction with a salesperson from this company and when it's you know i went to their website or you know i got this call right away it's normally not a pleasant experience for them they're like i was i didn't even know if i had an issue i was just trying to figure out what the situation's going on if this is a like a thing that's going on all over our industry if it's just me and i wasn't ready to talk to anyone it's you know it's it's sales is like dating You know, you, there's a process to court that perfect person. And if you, if you get too aggressive too soon, you you scare them off. And that's what happens in sales. And unfortunately, in many ways, I mean, there's, uh, you know, because they're, they are, I mean, buyers are getting bombarded, you know, there's, it's not just from vendors, but it's also from aggregator sites or or third party review sites or whatever it is Mm -hmm. and paid. So, um, it is you you have to be careful about the types of interactions because you don't want to just come across as another one who's just going to hound you uh, the minute you show any level of interest but you want to be a little bit more elegant well yeah and and buyers are getting way smarter you know when i started out in sales internet was not what it is now you know 20 mm-hmm. years ago the internet was in its infancy and salespeople were still the source of the bulk of all information for a buyer so we really were able to control the content that they got and when they got it and what we we're telling them. Well, now by the time they get to me as a salesperson, they've already done all this research. They know who my competitors are. They probably already talked to them. They've already figured out what is going to be the solution. Now they're just figuring out who can provide it best. So, you know, jumping in 
too soon is bad, but you also have to be concerned about waiting too long. You know, that there's this amazing stats that if you respond to someone after in five minutes of them submitting contact us, there's like an 800% increase chance of closing. So it, it's nuts. It's, you know, you have to do the, the tightrope walking thing on the contacts and the reach outs. Yeah. And the other thing I think that what's interesting about automation too is uh, that, I mean, nowadays we, people consume information in different ways or like to be yep. communicated with in different ways. And uh, so it's not a one size fits all at all. And you have to kind of figure out how that person likes to consume information and how they like to be interacted with. Yeah, it's you have to pay attention to how your prospects and your contact list is engaging. If they're clicking on every email, sweet, let's send them email. If they are going, if they see an email, but don't click, but then go to your website and do things and, and chat in through there, well, then they like the instant chat thing. You know, there's, you know, I see a ton of people and ton of clients out there, customers who have just... Have, have like picked this single channel of, hey, we're going to market this way. We're, we're all in on email. Sweet. Awesome. I can help you with that. But we should also look at these things and give people a choice. You know, I hate getting texts. I don't want to be marketed through text. I'm getting okay with the messaging thing, but you know, it still seems intrusive. I like the email because I can do it when I want. But there are a ton of people who want all the stuff to come through text right now. And you can't say no because you just want to do email. You have to figure out what your clients specifically want. And it's funny, you reminded me of, a, of a, an anecdote somebody told me um, last year or the year before that the, a, a sales coach, they were doing a ride along with the salesperson and they received, the salesperson received a text from the, the prospect or whatever, which is just a simple question. So they immediately called them. <laughs> yep. and and and, uh, and you know it was a very short conversation and afterwards uh the coach said why did you call them i said well they texted me you know so i mean i thought i'm gonna reach out immediately and get them he said but why didn't you text back and say is it okay for me to call you or do you just want me to answer over to you? because clearly they yep. texted you because that's how they wanted to communicate exactly you have to take the cues from the clients and give them the opportunities to make those choices because that's going to allow you when you're building out your automations to do a better job of communicating and it's going to force you you know an email you can write a three-page email really mm -hmm. easily but the client might not want a three-page email a lot of my clients are that high D personality. They want the bottom line up front. They want a text with, hey, what's in it for me? As mm -hmm. opposed to an email where I explain everything. Yeah. And if you don't give them the opportunities to make those choices and tell you how they want to communicate and how they're comfortable, you're going to end up making a guess and it's probably going to be wrong. Yeah, no, absolutely. So just um, put it, putting, uh, taking out your crystal ball for a moment, like where do you see sales automation going from here? Um, I, I, over the last year, we saw the huge adop adoption rates. We have had clients who were uh, doing everything in person and, you know, face-to-face. Uh, -face. Now it's like, oh, crap, I, I, I need to figure out this whole digital thing. So we had this huge adoption rate of, of that. And now, is, I think, as we're starting to, everyone's starting to relax a little bit and get out and about a little bit more, I think people are going to really now start looking at, all right, so how do we optimize this? How do we make this fit into a hybrid style selling process where we can take advantage of all the benefits of the, of the automation and the digital piece to communicate with our clients better, but we can still leverage having that real person and that face-to-face -face interaction, even if it's through a Zoom call. If you mm -hmm. do it right, you can still have meaningful conversations that way. Uh, but it's people are really gonna be looking at how they do them together. Yeah, I, I I would I would totally I would totally agree with you, um, and I think there is obviously after the pandemic and that that that, that there's a real, I mean people people want to engage they want to interact yep. and all that and yeah and I totally agree it can totally be do, done over Zoom, uh, too. But I think I think having that that balance between the automation and the human contact and as you said earlier building those 
human elements into the process is, is absolutely critical. And I do think that the, the that during the pandemic, uh, people have suddenly woken up to digital process. I mean, a lot of companies were, were blindsided by this. Yeah. They had paid lip, lip service to digital transformation, and then suddenly they were confronted with it. And some of them, it's been it's been a tough road. Yeah, we've done uh, a lot of really cool things with clients over the last year, one of which was how do we integrate direct mail and digital and utilize mm -hmm. both to give a, uh, a way for people to actually have that the uh, physical interaction of a, of a mailer, but then how do we customize it and I'll give them a, a digital experience that is that is only theirs. So we are saying things like that. Um, and, you know, fortunately for us in the digital world, you know, the onset of the pandemic was great for our business because now everyone's needing us. And um, so that was awesome. But, you know, a lot of people, it was very much a reactive thing. Oh, we got to have this now. And there wasn't a lot of thinking going into it on what that actually should look like and how to make it sustainable once everything went back to, you know, something more similar to what we had known before. Yeah. And I think if, if, if any companies are, are tempted just to sort of go back to paying lip service to, to uh, digital transformation, I think they'll, they'll suffer the consequences. I mean, it's interesting in our CRM. I mean, we have an automation engine in there, the automatizer, and it's really like, and I think this is this, and you're probably seeing the same thing. Is is a lot of sales organizations? It's the first time that they've, you know, marketing's always had their automation. Other things, yep. always, it's the first time they've realized, oh wow, there's a whole world here where we can we can use these tools to be more effective. And so I I, I do think that if if you are tempted to go back to the old ways and and not go back to or not adopt a more hybrid model or evolve, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah, I, I agree. And unfortunately, one of the big mistakes that management makes when it comes to automation, whether it be a marketing automation tool or a CRM tool, is they kind of do all the planning most of the times in this little closed room. It's like, oh, I want, we're going to get Salesforce and we're going to do this. And then here's how it's all going to work. And there's no interaction with the sales team and they aren't bringing them in and they don't always have a full understanding of what the day looks like for their salespeople. They have this idea of, hey, this is what my salespeople do and here's how they do it, but they don't actually know. So if you're going to do the digital transformation for your sales team, they need to be involved in that process. They need to help you design and understand what system is going to be used and why it's being used and how to integrate it because now that now gets buy-in. Yeah. And they're now going to actually use it because they help design it and they know it's going to be effective and help them. Yeah, no, I, I, it's a great point, uh, Kevin, because I do think that sometimes, I mean, management can assume, um, especially if you, you know, you people who maybe are out of sales a long time, or maybe weren't even ever in it, um, they can assume that, oh, this, this looks like a, this looks like a task that we should automate, let's automate that. Yep. And then the salesperson goes, no, well, actually, that's, that's something that's very valuable to me that I want to do myself. So yeah, I think they have to be involved. Well, they, you know, they don't even understand all the behind the scenes tasks that happen at each stage of the sales cycle. You know, if you sit down with the salesperson, have them walk you through the cycle and you keep asking why and, you know, digging deeper, you're going to find all these little tasks that they're doing that take time. And that's where you find the time savings and salespeople is understand, all right, so here's this one thing that they're all doing that they shouldn't have to do because it's, it's admin. They're re-entering mm -hmm. the same data in three different systems. Why? Why don't we have an API? Why don't we use Zapier or something to move this data around effectively? And, uh, and they don't ask those questions. Mm -hmm. No, and I, think, and I think that's why in many ways sales is the last one to the party on this yep. because, uh, well, let's face it too. It's like, you know, there's um, a process to some sales organization has been something that they frown upon almost. They say like, yeah, process is for other people. We're artists. And you go, well, no, process is for everybody. And you can't automate art, really. You can automate yep. processes. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, I think it has to be a combination of both. When mm -hmm. I got into sales, my first two uh, companies I worked for were, were Fortune 500 tech firms. So they sent me, you know, each one, I did two months of sales training. They mm -hmm. had spent millions of dollars to figure out how to sell and design a process and to teach you how to move through that process. 
when I moved from there into the small business, there was none of that. It was literally, oh, you're in sales. You're successful. Go sell. I was successful because they taught me how to sell their product. So it's, you know, it is an art to sales and the art is the really how you interact with the people and how you recognize who you're talking to and how to communicate with them and how to move them through the process. The science is the process. You know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's like baking there. It's very much science-based. If you're going to make is fantastic pastry dessert, the art is how you manipulate that process to get the fantastic flavors out of it. And the sales is the exact same way. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I think sometimes when you point out, like there's been research done by ZS Associates, McKinsey and others that uh, show that top performing sales organizations have well-defined sales process. And they also not just stages, but within those stages yep. well-defined activities and they're rigorously enforced. But that doesn't mean that, you know, that as you say, the art is in what you do during those activities, what you do during those stages and how you build the relationships. And in reality, it's giving you a, it's giving you that path, that track to run on the thing that you got from the, the, the big organization. Mm-hmm. Early on. Yeah, it's it's a map. That's all it really is that helps you not waste time going down the wrong wrong path. Yeah. And so that you can focus your time on the relationship and the interaction and and building value as opposed to trying to figure out okay, what's my next step? What is the next strategy we should try? All right, so maybe what if we do this and talk about that? Well, no, follow the path. Follow the yellow brick road. It'll get you to Oz and you can build some really cool relationships along the way and sell a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And I think the other important part is, you know, make sure that there is a a constant feedback loop and a constant examining of whether things are working. Because here's the other thing, Kevin, and you probably experienced this too. Sometimes people think, well, I I have a process. Now let's just embed that and we don't have to worry about that for the next couple of years when, as we know, things change so rapidly. Plus, you should be seeing, is your process working? Is all, are different parts of it working? Are there things that can be improved? And I think it has to be a living, breathing thing. I, I Yeah, I completely agree. I love having continuous testing going on and when you're doing process development. Yes, there's going to be that initial push where you're going to build this baseline process that you're going to test for a few months and just make sure that it's not completely out of whack with how things work. But then after that, it's has, there has to be this continuous split testing. You have to be saying, all right, so let's try these two things. We'll have team A do this and team B do this, or we're going to change this in our messaging a little bit and see what a reaction is you have to keep testing it because that's how you evolve and you keep up with your clients as their uh, as their intelligence about your product changes and the the environment that they're purchasing in changes if you're not testing you're going to get left behind because your competitors are yeah, 100%. Well, listen, um, Kevin, this has been fantastic. All of Kevin's information is going to be below this video. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and your company. So yeah, Time on Target is mine. I launched it almost 12 years ago now. And it actually, we launched it as a public speaking training firm. So we went in and I taught people how to network and how to sell. And uh, over time, it's uh, really... Um, we've pivoted a few times to fit where we were feeling the passion, where we could really help our clients the most. So right now we focus on helping businesses understand how their clients buy and how they sell and then how to integrate technology effectively into that process so that it actually works for them and it doesn't take up a ton of time for them to administer and it allows the business owner to actually work on scaling their business. Yeah, and I would I would highly re- highly recommend that if you don't have that skill set within your company, and to be perfectly honest, very few do, uh, because it's relative new. I would say you know reach out to somebody like Kevin and his company because you'll save yourself a lot of time, heartache, and money in the long run if you get this right first time. Yeah, business owners are amazing people. They started this business because they had a passion about something and they had this fantastic skill no one starts a company because they were a great salesperson. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or a great automation person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wasn't when I started. So <laughs> I, my passion was being on stage and helping and working with people. And now look what it's grown into over, over the course of 10 to 12 years. So, yeah. Well, congratulations. 12 years is something to be proud of. 
All right, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. Thanks again to Kevin and thank you all for watching and listening and I will see you all again soon. Thank you.